Uh, good evening, all, uh, and welcome to the Washington Institute Scholar Statesman Award Dinner. I'm John Shapiro, and it's my great pleasure to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Washington Institute and to serve as chair of the dinner along with my wife, Shani Silverberg. Given the remarkable honorees we have this evening, this is as much an honor for us as it is for them. Let me begin by thanking His Majesty King Abdullah II, Her Majesty Queen Rania al-Abdullah, and His Royal Highness Crown Prince al-Hussein for jo joining us tonight. We are thrilled by your presence. Now, in a movie, Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king. Uh, uh, that may be true, but having attended group meetings with the king and visited with his ministers in Jordan multiple times, I know that King Abdullah faces extremely complex challenges. With his relentless commitment to peace, he's approached these issues with strong leadership, tremendous intelligence, and from my perspective, great courage. Your Majesty, the world could use more leaders of your caliber. And we look forward to later in the program when you will have a conversation with Rob Satloff. This evening, we also have an opportunity to pay tribute to two of New York's leading citizens and two of my closest friends, Merrill and Jim Tisch. Tonight, we are not just honoring Merrill and Jim. We are also celebrating the values they hold dear. Our honorees believe in the importance of family, faith, and community. They believe in the power of education to transform lives and lift up societies. They believe we have to live up to our responsibilities, wherever that takes us, on the local, national, and international levels. They believe that it is vital to stand up and be counted to engage in the world around us, and to lead with passion and humility. Our honorees do not just hold these values, they live these values through selfless public service. In fact, I would say that for us, they sort of qualify as our version of royalty. So once again, the Washington Institute has orchestrated an extraordinary event. Of course, the Washington Institute has been honoring outstanding events, hosting astounding events for years, honoring such luminaries as President Bill Clinton, Prime Minister Tony Blair, Secretaries of State Henry Kissinger, Condoleezza Rice, and George Shultz, former CIA Director George Tenet, to name a few. Now, for many organizations, an event of this magnitude would be enough. But in fact, the Washington Institute has attracted 25 top scholars from eight countries many of whom have served in significant government positions. And one could argue that this would be enough. However, these experts provide important position papers, presentations, and advice on critical issues. So again, well, maybe in this crowd I should be saying Dianu. <laughs> uh, actually, there's only one thing you really know, need to know about the Washington Institute. Serious people take them seriously. Let me repeat that. Serious people take them seriously. Therefore, embedded in any of the solutions to the challenge of the Middle East will be the DNA of the Washington Institute. So I thank you for your support tonight, and I hope you will continue to support us in the future. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce a man who has also devoted his life to public service, the Minority Leader of the United States Senate, Senator Charles Chuck Schumer. Well, thank you so much, John, and good evening to everybody. It's just great to be here among this such a distinguished and esteemed group. We live in troubled times, ladies and gentlemen, and so I am especially grateful to spend time among scholars and statesmen, and particularly those like King Abdullah. He represents a union of both. He represents the kind of strength and stability and honor and steadfastness, we need many more leaders like you 
Your Highness, and thank you so much, Your Majesty, and thank you so much for you and your family. I want to take a moment to thank the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, for my good friends Shawnee Ship Silverberg and John Shapiro for organizing this dinner. Now your executive director, Rob, Shat Rob Satloff and Jim Schreiber, have been such great partners in tackling so many of the pressing foreign affairs issues facing our country. I'll note I recently nominated one of your fellows, Dana Stroll, to co-chair the Syria Study Group alongside another one of your fellows, Michael Singh. Their recent report was extremely well received, more proof that the Washington Institute for Near East Policy is hiring experts who vo whose voices must be heard in the halls of power. But this evening, my job is an easy one. I'm here to speak about two incredibly special people, special in the life of my wife and myself and in so many others who are here, Jimmy and Merrill Tisch, to whom we're paying special tribute. Jimmy and Merrill have been best friends with my wife Iris and me for more than 35 years. And I can say selflessly, but with complete confidence, that they are the best friends anyone could ever have. To me, Jimmy's like a brother, and Merrill is like a second sister. Let me talk about each of them separately, and then why I think the two of them make such a unique and dynamic couple. First, Jimmy. Some of you have heard the story how I first met Jimmy, and it's a tribute not only to him but to his dad. I was dating my wife, Iris, and a friend of ours invited us to a barbecue at his home in Westchester. I was a young assemblyman, and he was trying to help me meet people. He said, it's a barbecue. Well, Iris and I were kids from Brooklyn. Barbecue, you know, we thought it was hot dogs and hamburgers in the backyard. We put on jeans and flannel shirts and drove up to this gentleman's house to be greeted by valet parking, a big tent, and chefs with toques. Iris said, let's get out of here. I said, no, let's see what's going on. So we go to the event, and it's a long line. You get your food, and they didn't have assigned seats. So we sat at a table by ourselves. And a couple, years older than we were, sat down next to us. We had a great conversation. They were so interested in the New York State Assembly, what was going on in Brooklyn, and so many other things. And at the end of it, I said, what's your name, sir? He said, well, my name is Larry Tisch. This is my wife, Billy. I've never met anyone who'd be so compatible with my son. You have to meet Jimmy. <laughs> one of La Larry had so many brilliances, and that was just one of them. And it's true, he was right. We have been, that started a beautiful 35-year friendship, and it's blossomed. In all that time, even though, as many of you know, Jimmy and I don't always agree on every issue, our friendship has never suffered for it. He's always willing to engage with different opinions, like the intellectually curious scholar that he truly is. And then, more than not, more often than not, persuade those who disagree with him to adopt his way of thinking, just like any statesman would. I know from experience, Jimmy has helped me see the world in a different way on so many issues, in large part due to the graciousness and humility with which he conducts himself. It's amazing. When you ask a question, let's ask this question. How can someone born into privilege and a prominent family retain such a deep sense of humility and compassion? Anyone who wishes to know the answer to that riddle should study Jimmy Tisch. It's too often a rarity. At a time when there's so much narcissism in the world, and so much of that narcissism is rewarded, it's a relief that someone like Jimmy, who is so good-natured and, so, and never self-aggrandizing, is not only successful, but more important to him and to all of us, respected and loved. While Jimmy is always humble, always understated when it really matters, you feel his presence like a force of nature. And so it's so appropriate that he and Merrill are being honored because Jimmy is a true scholar statesman that this organization 
tries to help and nurture, and I'm proud to call him my friend. But that's less than half of this story. What about Jimmy's better half? Now, Merrill wasn't born into the same privilege as he was. Instead of a silver spoon, she got a soup ladle. But even as our star rose and the world came to realize Merrill's immense talent, she never forgot her roots growing up on the Lower East Side. Even though she lives on Fifth Avenue, she'll never forget Grand Street. Merrill took all that she learned from her upbringing, her tireless work ethic, her generosity of spirit, her good humor, and she, used it, she uses it constantly to make the world a better place. You can trace Merrill's service and the millions, literally, that she has helped directly and indirectly from the classrooms of New York City, the boardrooms of some of the most impactful civic, educational, and philanthropic organizations in New York, to the New York State Board of Regents, where she served as a great chancellor, and to today, where she's applying her considerable talents to help, the, to, to help guide the wonderful SUNY system as chair of their board of trustees. Anyone who's worked in the world of education knows how fierce those whirlwinds can blow. But because Merrill is always true to her internal gyroscope, to improve education for students, no matter what special interests stand in the way, she has never been blown off course, and as a result, continues to raise the quality of education for the kids in New York. And I'll say one other thing about Merrill. She can be tough, but she'll tell, and she'll tell you she needed that to survive back in the days on Grand Street. But that tough exterior masks a heart of gold. One of the most, what, the, the ways that we can judge people and know about people is this. There are some people who do true acts of kindness, who go out of their way to help people in need, and no one ever knows about it, and they never talk about it, never brag about it. They just do it because it's them. Merrill does, the, I'm a little touched by that. Merrill does those things all the time. So, for that and many other reasons, Merrill, too, is a true scholar stateswoman, and I'm proud to call her my friend. Jimmy and Merrill grew up in totally different worlds, but they were brought together by similar values, the importance of family, education, hard work, religion, and the world, our world, is so much better off for their union. Thank you. Before you're allowed to speak, I'm supposed to present you with this, if I can read it. To Merrill and James Tisch, who lead by example, with generosity and compassion, commitment and wisdom, in gratitude, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, November 21, 2019. Who feels strong? <laughs> Chuck, thank you very much. I'm going to put lie to what you said about humility, humble, and no self-aggrandizement. Because I think that the title for tonight should be The King and I. And now for my prepared comments. <laughs> Merrill and I are both grateful to have been accorded this great honor. And this is the truth, particularly in the presence of His Majesty the King of Jordan. It is a testament to the high regard 
in which the Washington Institute is held across the Middle East that His Majesty graciously accepted the invitation to be with us tonight. Your Majesty, thank you for your presence. You honor us with it. Through our long association with the Institute, Merrill and I have been privileged to learn about its many important contributions to U.S. foreign policy. We know that whenever a major issue emerges in the Middle East, government officials turn to the Washington Institute for advice and consultation. Part of the Institute's strength is its ability to work quietly behind the scenes to advance U.S. interests in the region. The Institute does not publicize all its successes because it takes pride in its accomplishments, not in its fame. Far be it for me to tell tales out of school here tonight. However, allow me to share a few items that demonstrate the Institute's impact. For example, a year ago, the United States brought together Arab and Israeli leaders in Warsaw for a one-of-a-kind gathering to focus on the challenge of Iran. This included a closed-door discussion between Arab foreign ministers and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Who else but Institute Counselor Dennis Ross, a man respected by Arabs and Israelis, Democrats and Republicans, could lead such a session. Similarly, over the past two years, Executive Director Rob Satloff's quiet partnership with the head of the powerful Saudi-backed Muslim World League produced unprecedented statements denouncing Holocaust denial and endorsing the need for Muslim schools to include Holocaust education in their curricula. The Institute is a place where Saudi royals like Prince Turki Al Faisal and the kingdom's most famous dissident, Jamal Khashoggi, have both found a platform to express their thoughts. It is a place where the just retired chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces can work alongside, alongside a former negotiator for the Palestinian Authority, a Lebanese Shiite, and the son of an Iranian Ayatollah. Perhaps most impressive of all, the Institute is a nonpartisan refuge where Democrats and Republicans alike can share ideas in a civil manner and every once in a while agree. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, two Institute fellows, as, my, as Chuck said, Mike Singh and Dana Struhl, testified in Congress in their capacity as the Republican and Democratic co-chairs, respectively, of the congressionally mandated serious study group. Not only did lawmakers of both parties agree to appoint the two Institute experts to lead the panel, they concurred with the study group's recommendations. The Institute's impact can also be seen in the work of the experts who move from its offices to the halls of government. Today, the diplomat responsible for all U.S. Middle East policy, Assistant Secretary of State David Schenker, and the envoy leading our engagement with Syria and our campaign against ISIS, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, are both former Institute fellows. David and Jim follow in a long line of Institute experts who have been in Democratic and Republican administrations. These examples of the Institute's quiet effectiveness are just a few of the reasons that Merrill and I are so closely affiliated with this organization. As the Washington Institute enters its 35th anniversary year, we remain committed to the Institute's mission may it continue to go from strength to strength. Thank you once again for this incredible honor.